In today's video, we are continuing on from last week. Last week, we discussed the first three phases that I run through in my mind, at least, when I'm designing a building management system for a data center from a consultant's point of view. So today we'll continue with two more of the phases. And uh, I think next week we'll wrap it up with the last two phases. In phase four, um, it sort of flows on slightly from phase three, but I then start to think about, okay, that was all my instrumentation dealt with. So I know that I have duty standby instrumentation, valves, you know, feedback, that sort of stuff. Um, the next part is what other monitoring do I need that falls outside of this HVAC control? And, and the obvious one is, is the hand off auto switch on the mechanical board. So ideally you should monitor the hand off and auto position, that's three digital inputs. I think it's slightly overkill, although a lot of people do want that and it could be in a brief, the client's brief even. But I tend to only monitor the auto position on the hand of auto switch. If it's in auto, my digital input on my controller is on. And if someone turns that to off or to manual, I lose my auto position and the alarm goes off and go check it out. So there's overridden on or overridden off. In my mind, they're both not acceptable and there should be an alarm. So to try and like manage the cost of these sort of things, and there's lots of hand of auto switches, often one for each piece of mechanical equipment. So I have been um, trying to compromise there and just monitoring the auto position. Um, as we touched on maybe last week, you could monitor the position of the VSD power isolator. If someone turns that off, you'd be surprised if that would help you. Um, you might be tempted to um, determine that the power is off by the variable speed drive going from online to offline, and that might be okay. Just make sure that that network signal is reliable, however you're doing that. But what I really want to focus in this section is um, things like a UPS. So I have seen it before where, for whatever reason, whether it was not designed or not coordinated or just forgotten about, we didn't get UPS 1, UPS 2 main power supplies of the main UPSs. And I guess those UPSs went and did stuff, but because we didn't coordinate it properly with electrical, blah, 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 we ended up not getting it done. And then two weeks before practice completion, when we all realized there's a major issue here, the BMS contractor provides a UPS and plonks it into the bottom of the control panel. And I have seen this, this does happen. And that UPS is normally one of these sort of desktop UPSs. Um, they're not very good. They work for a few years, a couple of years, and they don't work the batteries don't last very long. But the point I'm making here is this, that if you're gonna provide a UPS under the BMS scope of work, you need to provide one of these bypass switches. Because what happened in this job was, uh, when the UPS is plugged in, how do you remove the UPS to replace it? Or how do you uh, change the batteries? You can't, because as soon as you pull that plug out, to, to pull it out, the panel goes dead. If you had a bypass switch, you'd, you'd switch into bypass and the 240 volts would be bypassed around the UPS and your power would remain, your panel would be powered while you get the UPS out and replace the batteries or change and put it back in again. Because, you know, there's nothing worse than you standing there and you open up the control panel and you're looking at this UPS and thinking, what do I do now? Like, I can't do anything with that thing because if I pull the wire out, you know, we're in big trouble. So let me tell you why this is important. Just give me a second. I just want to go Google something here. I'm going to read out to you the four tier ratings of a data center. Tier one, two, three, four. Tier four is the best. Tier one is the worst. So a tier one data center has a single path for power and cooling and few, if any, redundant and backup components. It is expected to have an uptime of 99 0.671% or 288 hours of downtime annually. So that's a very like, you know, there's, there's one power supply and there's one air conditioning. So I don't, I don't see those ones very often. Tier two, a tier two data center has a single path for power and cooling and some redundant and backup components. It has an expected uptime of 99.741% 
or 22 hours of downtime annually. Now here's the point that I want to get to is a tier three data center. A tier three data center has multiple paths for power and cooling and systems in place to update and maintain it without taking it offline, right? That means with a tier three data center, you should be able to maintain all of the BMS instrumentation and the controllers, the power supplies, everything should be maintainable without disruption to the data center. Uh, tier four is similar. A tier four data center is built to be completely fault tolerant and has redundancy for every component. It has an expected uptime of 99.995%, 26.3 minutes of downtime annually. That's why I said to you, read the client's brief, because if the client's brief, it will say this, it'll say this is a tier three or a tier four data center. When you hear those two tiers, you get a big fright, because even if the, um, the mechanical consultant at page 200 in the BMS section hasn't nicely you know, described all this, the fact that the brief says tier three or tier four means you've got a big problem. So you can't, have, you can't have a UPS in there, a rubbish $300 UPS with no bypass switch that can't be maintained because a tier four data center which said it can only have downtime of 26 minutes per year. Like, you know, in BMS land, downtime is something breaks, I'll give you a fee proposal by next week, you send me a purchase order, there'll be a six week lead time for those new valves. Like in BMS land, downtime is months. We're talking minutes here. So if it's a tier three data center or a tier four data center, you need to spend some money. You need to have positive feedback. Don't like try and skimp on saving on a few things. Uh, if your salesman hasn't allowed for all this stuff to have a completely maintainable while running data center, you need to go talk to them. You need to start putting in some variations or do whatever needs to be done because you cannot, you cannot have one chilled water bypass valve and actuator there. You can't have one because if you need to replace that or something or it fails, you need to have another one. Whether you've allowed for it or not, you've got a problem to sort out there. Now in phase five, I want to talk about network, which is a very big topic and we could do a whole series on just data center network design. We're obviously not going to do that here. I just want to give you a few pointers of a few things to consider. The first one is, so like me personally, I'm not an expert in, you know, virtual servers and, you know, redundancy and the software that changes over the virtual servers. I'm a bit scared of that. So what I tend to do is, um, I'm not embarrassed about that. That's just not my strength. So I'm going to fall back on what my strengths are and have another backup plan. So what I do is I put a touch screen always in the plant room, the data center. And, you know, usually the server hosts out web page graphics to you know workstations or mobile phones or touchscreens. I try and set that up that that touchscreen doesn't get its graphics from the server. So either host the graphics on that touchscreen, you might not be able to do that, or host the graphics in the network controller or the field controller, very basic graphics just to get you by. But I try and specify it that if you walk into the plant room, if the server does or something happens, go to the touch screen and you can get basic information about the running status of the data center and override things or whatever you need to do in there. So that's what I try and do. I always have a touch screen in there. The next thing is a lot of BMS companies, their, their field controllers or their network controllers are now coming with dual ethernet ports on them. And I've done a little bit of research into a couple of these BMS systems and my opinion is, that these controllers, those two ethernet ports, they cannot be set up to run redundant protocols. They're just like layer two switches in those controllers. They're not layer three switches. So we can't set up um, spanning tree protocol or rapid spanning tree protocol or, or the other proprietary redundant protocols, which means that you can daisy chain those controllers, but you can't wire them into a complete ring in my opinion. So, whether a BMS system has the dual ethernet ports, I just, I ignore them. I don't factor that into any sort of a, re a reliable ethernet design or a robust ethernet design. 
Also, I have the opinion, personal opinion, that on that printed circuit board of that controller, that little network switch, it's like this big. It's a tiny little thing. It's not gonna have very robust components, expensive components, because the control itself is reasonably cost-effective. So I don't like that little switch thing that's in the controller, so I don't use those things. That's, that's the second part. I, I don't use those things, and I don't think you should consider them either. My, my personal opinion, and I'm saying personal opinion a lot here because a lot of what we do is just our own experiences, but I've been overruled on this almost every time, but I think that when you have these three controllers for a network and these, these three panels, the three chillers, I think that a daisy-chained RS-485 cable uh, you know, back then MSTP is actually quite reliable. I'm not talking about that cable going around the whole plant room or you know, into another plant room or up onto the roof where the VSDs are and electric meters and thermal meters. I'm just saying we've got a very small sub-network over here because the only way for that sub-network to become you know, unreliable is if you cut the cable, now the cable just goes from here to here. I can't see a cable being cut very easily. It's not like, you know, going through a, into another plant room and there's some works going on somewhere. That's not going to happen, I don't think, or down a rasa, something like that. And also, or you've got to pull one of the, ca or one of the cables got to be pulled out the terminal. Again, I can't see that happening. It's quite a controlled environment, this. Um, so I actually think that RS-485 on small segments, a small one here, small one there, small one there, I think it's reasonably reliable on a short, you know, two meter distance um, compared to network switches that the network switch can fail, the, the power supply can fail, there's a whole bunch of things. The patch lead plugs out really nice and easily, and they're normally quite accessible. But um, every single time the, the data center engineers uh, or their IT department or the network engineers, they always overall me and say like, no, serial communications, that's not reliable enough and they always go build one hell of a big you know, mesh arrangement of mesh network switches, $5,000 each, which is fine. Go ahead and do that, guys. Um, I don't mind. So I just wanted to sort of touch on that. I also, what I've been doing now is I have like my HVAC control sort of network of stuff. And then I have, I try and sort of have the monitoring network slightly separate. So that I have, you know, a gateways or routers or um, network controllers that would go off to monitor the crack units or um, the electric meters and the automatic transfer switches and the generators and the UPS and all those things. So what I've been trying to do is, and that will be in a different cabinet in the room somewhere, its own network 19 inch little rack mount cabinet, wherever it is. Because if something goes wrong with my control network um, and I can't see that, at least I can see everything else on the monitoring network. And usually you can see lots of stuff on that monitoring network, variable speed drives, all sorts of things. Um, so I'll be trying to do that. So that is probably enough for this week. Uh, do try and keep these videos under 15 minutes. Um, so we'll wrap it up today and we'll continue next week, which will be the final session in this BMS design for data centers, when we discuss the last two phases that I would normally run through. Uh, please like and subscribe and have a good week.